I preferred when they sparkled. Hello everyone, our photo reviews here. Coming at you with another book review. Coming at you with another review to help you decide. Is that book worth reading of a second breakfast? Or does it deserve the fiery pits of Mount Doom? So let's decide. Today's book is Marked. Marked is a young adult book published on May 1st of 2007, which means I was very wrong about it coming out while I was getting out of high school. I wasn't even in high school yet. And it was written by the mother-daughter duo PC Cast and Kristen Cast, with the former being the mother, half of the dynamic. However, I've read online that it was actually more appropriately written by Kristen Cast, and PC Cast worked mostly in editorial at editing capacity. Though these were the debut books of Kristen Cast, though, PC Cast had two other series in production just before this and during the time this was being released. Though, the House of Night series, of which Mark is the first book in, were easily the most popular works that she had worked on. It was able to get onto the New York Times bestseller list at the 16th spot and held that spot for almost 89 weeks, which... For reference, that's like a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, about a year and a half. Actually, a little over. Before it was eventually replaced. And it did remit, rip, It did win the Romantic Time Reviewer Choice Young Adult Novel Award in 2009. Normally, when I look into these books, like House of Night, you typically find a fair amount of controversies behind the book. Either that by something the author did or something the book says. But shockingly, like sort of like um, Mortal Instruments, how there's a big controversy on whether or not the author for Mortal Instruments stole her, stole her entire concept from another author who wrote the Shadow Hunters series, I think. Which I've looked into it a little bit. I'm still trying to find the first book on that. But shockingly, I wasn't able to find a lot of that in these books. In a sense, uh, I'm obviously going to talk about some things here because this book has a very justifiable reputation with uh, how its main character is, but I'll get into that more in the review. You, you, th it was it was shockingly light on controversies, which is did surprise me, and and we're going to find out later on why that surprised me. So, uh, without further ado, here's the here's the rating card. And then we move on to the cover. Now the cover for Marked, at least the one I have, is not very good in my opinion. We have our character up here to the left, who is clearly meant to be our main character, Zoe Redbird. And she's super white. And I don't mean that just because she's heavily washed out with the lighting and the black and white filter that was slapped on afterwards. All in an attempt to make those purple eyes stand out. I mean... I mean, Zoe doesn't even have those in the book, as far as I could tell. Also, where are her glasses? The book references her... No, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go into a rant, but I can't. Uh, also, she doesn't wear glasses, which the book does reference her as wearing once, although never references it again. But, like, Zoe in the book is half Cherokee. And trust me, you get reminded of that a lot. But for something that gets such focus on in the book, you would think that when they made the cover... They would at least use someone who had a little more color in their skin. I mean, Zoe in the book itself is described as having an olive complexion. So it's weird that they that they use this very, very white-skinned girl to represent Zoe. At least that's who I assume is Zoe. If I'm wrong, then this, this whole complaint is invalid. Just ignore it. Uh, apart from that, the book is just a black background, and it has a laminated pattern over it that makes it shine in just the right light. I, I don't know if I can get it to show properly on the camera here, but like, like I have to do that to see all of it, but it's all throughout. And I, I will give that it does make the book slightly more eye-catching in that sort of subtle way, like, like your eye catches it because it's reflecting light, but the pattern means nothing to the story, so it's kind of pointless. I haven't seen any other covers, but looking it up, it, it seems like this is the cover they're really stuck to. So if you guys have a cover that's way better, go ahead and share it with me. Or I, I might edit it in here if I find one. But the question is, what is this story about? Well, if you want to if you wanna see how the book presents itself, I would really recommend checking out my Garb August TBR this month. I released it just 
three days ago at this point. So if you want to hear how the book presents itself, seriously, go there and check it out. Also, I could really use the views, but you know, let, let's go ahead and give you some context in here though for the sake of the review. Zoe, Zoe Redbird, who isn't even, doesn't even start the book as Zoe Redbird, but so we'll just call her Zoe for now. Zoe Red, Zoe is an average teenage girl attending high school and has her life thrown upside down when she's marked by a tracker vampire. See, in this world, when a tracker vampire marks you, they awaken the inner vampiric nature in that you have. Because in this world, vampires aren't made with bites, but born. And you only have a small amount of time to go to the nearest house of night to continue the training before you die. Forced to flee from home from an ultra-conservative family who refuses to accept her change, and trust me, despite the perfect allegory there, I really, really doubt the series is going to go that route based on what I read. Uh, at the House of Night, she finds new friends, a different society she integrates into more easily, and perhaps even love from a hunky boy who's instantly enraptured with her and is declaring his undying love within two days of meeting her. But more importantly, Zoe awakens her inner Mary Sue powers and realizes it's actually she who was destined to lead the local club in high school, meaning she must find a way to oust the current leader, a terrible girl named Aphrodite. Zoe claims this is for altruistic reasons, but I'll buy that when hell freezes over. Before I get too into it, if you can't tell by my read of the synopsis, I don't, I did not enjoy reading this book. Well, I kind of enjoyed it, I just didn't like it. The book was a uh, genuine struggle to read to at, at certain points, and there are a lot of reasons why. The first and most obvious reason is that our main character, Zoe Redbird, is honestly just the most unpleasant person to follow. She is one of the most casually judgmental, annoying, hypocritical people I've ever had the misfortune of getting stuck inside the head of. Is she as hypocritical as the guy from Redeeming Love? Maybe not, but she comes way too close for my liking. Like, even from page three, I could tell Zoe was just going to be an awful character to be stuck inside the head of for the entire book. For example, this is from page five. The context of the scene is Zoe has just woken up from being marked as a tracker vampire and should be focusing on the fact that her entire life has changed and she doesn't know where it's going. Instead, we get this lengthy monologue out of nowhere. Do vampires play chess? Were they like vampire dorks? How about Barbie-like vampire cheerleaders? Did vampires play in the band? Were there vampire emos? Were there guy-wearing girl pants, weird mouths, and there's awful bangs that cover half their faces? Or were they all those freaky goth kids who didn't like to bathe much? Was I going to turn into a goth kid? Or an emo? I didn't particularly like wearing black, at least not exclusively. And I wasn't feeling a sudden and unfortunate aversion to soap and water, nor did I have an obsessive desire to change my hairstyle and wear too much eyeliner. And, and this is just a running theme with Zoe. Unless you're one of her sycophantic friend group, and even then, if, if only if she likes you back, does she ever seem to really have a single nice or even neutral thought towards people? And even if she does like you, she seems to find several negative things to think about you anyways. I'll give her the credit that she doesn't typically speak this stuff aloud, but it's not much better when you're in a first-person point of view book. Like, her first introduction to what her best friend at the start of the book, Kayla, is just her complaining about how much her friend talks. Now, personally, I do have a little theory on just why Zoe is such a judgmental woman, and I think it has something to do with the fact that this was a mother-daughter duo who wrote this. Now, my theory here. I think PC Cass walked in on her daughter writing an erotic Twilight fan fiction. Kristen, having been 19 at the time Twilight would have been released, would have put her right in that perfect target audience that uh, Stephanie Meyer was aiming for. And Kristen, too ashamed to admit what she was doing, quickly covered it up by saying, no, 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 she's writing a story about her own vampire. But PC Cass, being the mother she is, obviously try to help. She has the experience writing. But like all children, Kristen is too ashamed to admit her real thoughts on things, so we see her way overcorrect in the other direction. Because to me, that's the only way someone can write a character like Zoe Redbird and miss the mark as hard as they possibly could. Now, what is the, re what, what is the reason I think this? What is my evidence? 
My source is that I made it the fuck up. No, no, but but seriously, it, it's Zoe Redbird is such a such a weird character because she's this rebellious teenage daughter from an ultra conservative religious fundamental household, but like not in any way that matters. She just doesn't like the religion, but by nature she she literally believes everything that is being put onto her. She just doesn't like who it's coming from. Like she claims to understand that what the people <clears throat> like she claims to understand what the people of faith are supposed to be in this book. Yeah, think of the people of faith like the Westboro Baptist Church basically. It's just a group who wants to use religion to control people. But in that same vein, Zoe is the exact type of person who would fit right in because she pretty much hates everything that they would hate. Like no one th no offense, but I I legitimately cannot see a teenage girl in the early 2000s saying this. Heath, I tried to sound patient. They are not safer than cigarettes. And even if they are, that's not saying much. Cigarettes are disgusting and they kill you. And seriously, the biggest losers at school smoke pot. Besides the fact you really cannot afford to kill any more brain cells. I almost added or sperms, but I didn't want to go there. Nor could I see her saying this. Well, hell, they were filling the room with pot smoke mixed with spices. Unbelievable. I stood up to peer pressure and for years said no to even the most polite offers to try one of those gross-looking homemade joints. They get passed around at parties and whatnot. Parentheses. I mean, please, is that even sanitary? And just exactly why would I want to do a drug that made me want to obsessively eat fattening snack foods? End parentheses. Or, 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 or this excuse, which sounds just like one of the excuses I've heard my own sisters tell my mom when I knew they'd definitely done the thing that they were pretending that they currently hated because that sells it better for some reason. We all responded while well, I blinked my vision clear and the weird image of Aphrodite as Neferet faded, as did the burning on my mark. But I could still taste the wine on my tongue. It was way strange. I don't like alcohol. Seriously, I just don't like the way it tastes. And I find this particularly bad because when Zoe comes into conflict with the main antagonist of the book, it comes off less like a good person going against a bad person, but rather, Zoe doesn't like Aphrodite because she's just a more sex-positive version of Zoe, who's also more vocal about her judgments. Because seriously, f for as much as this book wants you to side with Zoe and hate Aphrodite, the book itself fails to see that the two are literally the same person in almost every way. Zoe and Aphrodite are both extremely judgmental people who think they're better than everyone else and surround themselves with sycophantic friends who probably only stay with them because of their perceived value. Zoe claims that her desire to oust Aphrodite is based on altruistic reasons in this section here. It's true that we don't like Aphrodite, but I think it's important not to focus on negatives, like kicking her ass or pushing her out of the Dark Daughters. That's what she would do in our place. What we want is what's right, more like justice than revenge. We're different than her, and if we somehow manage to take our place in the Dark Daughters, the group will be different too. But this is a lie. There is no actual altruistic reasoning to why she wants to oust Aphrodite from the leadership of the Dark Daughters. Again, the best I, there's no reason necessarily given why being the leader of the Dark Daughters is so important. As far as you're aware this is like the equivalent of the student council and trying to impeach the student council president, like they have actual power. Then again, I am student body president. Smith, what's the meaning of this? Principal Lewis, I'm taking your office. At best, you could argue that Zoe thinks Aphrodite, who is clairvoyant and can see future tragedies in her visions, is hiding her visions because she wants humans to die. But there's no proof of that. All Zoe has to go on is the fact that two of the people that she's friends with, the twins, who are extremely judgmental and catty, say, claim that they saw Aphrodite try to hide one of her visions once. 
And even then, it was more of a rumor through the grapevine kind of thing. Something that doesn't even make sense in the book itself, because the vision was was said to Neferet, the uh, the, the main good person. I, I do quotes like that. I'll explain later. And saved saved the lives of the people she had the vision about. The twins just assume Aphrodite didn't have plans to share and was forced to because they ran in because. They saw Aphrodite run into Neferet in the middle of spasming while she has her, while her friends are trying to carry her out of the room. In addition, the one vision that Zoe does see Aphrodite have, she's outside of Neferet's office having it. So in a sense, it doesn't work either because it does look like Aphrodite was trying to get to Neferet before the vision occurred and the spasming seizure-like event that occurs whenever she gets a vision happened before she could actually get to Neverett. So when Zoe constantly spouts off about having the moral high ground and getting Aphrodite out, remember that she's only doing it because she doesn't like Aphrodite and because she thinks that the goddess has decided she needs Aphrodite's spot. Which, by the way, definitely not kidding about that. Zoe is the protagonist of a young adult urban fantasy setting involving vampires. You get three guesses on how the authors decide to write her. He will call our protagonist uh, Mary Sue. Now, I don't make this claim lightly. I've encountered various levels of Mary Sue throughout my time reading. Everything from the simple, more forgivable one like Mark in Trans Soul Saga. Mark is a, I think, I, I'm really hoping I'm remembering that name right. Mark is a Mary Sue in that he always has the answer and never seems to lose at anything. But it's forgivable because not only was Trans Soul Saga written for a much younger audience than this one, Mark is never so much of a Mary Sue, it ruins the story itself. There are points where he does struggle, it's just not struggling in a way that actually makes you feel like he's in danger. But then you have the opposite end of the spectrum, like, say, Elminster from the Elminster's Doom book. Every character was crying that he had lost his magic, despite the fact you never actually feel like he was left wanting for terms of spells due to the sheer amount of magical objects he had on him throughout the entire book. And people go out of their way to defend him for no other reason than he's Elminster. And you basically, everything works out in his favor despite the fact that in, in the context of the world, he should be at his weakest possible strength. Zoe Redbird falls way more into the Elminster half of this debate. Actually, a little worse than Elminster because at least Elminster did have a likable personality. Whereas Zoe is a slut-shaming bitch. I, I mean, she's got all the hallmarks of Mary Sue. Anyone who, see, who likes her is meant to be seen as good. Anyone who doesn't like her is meant to be seen as awful. She's a vampire, but not just that, but she's a super awesome mega vampire years ahead of her peers in intelligence, development, powers, and wisdom. In fact, she's so super mega awesome special that the goddess has taken a personal attachment to her for no explained reason and totally wants her to run the Dark Sisters, which, you know, is basically just the student council of this world. I mean, if you're gonna make a Mary Sue character, at least have the decency to make him a likable person and don't make them the kind of person that says they don't care about someone dying because they didn't like that person, despite being there at the person's death and watching their last words as a feeble request for them to call his mom, only to then berate someone else for saying the same fucking thing. No one liked Elliot, and somehow I think that makes it worse, Stevie Ray said. It was weirdly easier with Elizabeth. At least we could honestly feel sorry she was gone. I know what you mean. I feel upset, but I know I'm really upset that I saw what can happen to us. And no, I can't get it out of my mind. And I'm not upset because that kid's dead. If we were humans, we'd call it survival of the fittest. Thank the goddess we're not humans, so let's just call it fate and be happy tonight that it didn't kick any of our asses. I was totally grossed out to hear the sounds of general agreement. I hadn't really known Elizabeth, but she'd been nice to me. Okay, I admit that I hadn't liked Elliot. No one had. The kid was annoying and unattractive. Parentheses. And his or whatever seemed to be carrying on those traits. I was not glad he died. Because, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what everyone likes in their uh, character. A hypocritical see you next Tuesday. Or what about the... T or like when she sees someone being S-A'd in the hall and the only thing she can do is rant about how 
Oh, well, this isn't cool, guys. Stop. You don't really want me to. Yes, I do. You like it. You know you like it. Just like you know you still want me. No! Oh, quit pretending. You know we'll always be together. C cut it out! You want me. You'll always want me. Yes, I was aware of the whole oral s thing. I doubt if there's a teenager alive in America today who isn't aware that most of the adult public think we're giving guys b like they used to give guys gum, parentheses, or more appropriately, suckers, in parentheses. Okay, that's just bullshit, and it's always made me mad. Of course there are girls who think it's cool to give guys head. Uh, they're wrong. Those of us with functioning brains know that it is not cool to be used like that. But I mean, I could rant all day about how awful Zoe is. So let's do myself some favors and just move on to some greener pastures. It only gets worse from here. For example, let's discuss this god-awful world building in this book. Now to start with, I'm going to address the fact that this is book one in a very long series. There's like 14 books in this series last I checked. And I will say that as of this moment, there was a lot of flubs in the world building that don't make sense, but I can guess at some of the twists coming that might explain this. Like, it's super obvious that Neferet is going to be revealed to be a bad guy, so it makes some sense with some of the flubs around her. But there are definite flubs here and there that I don't think can be fixed without actual retcons. For example, I'm confused on where vampires actually stand in this world in terms of social perception. From how Zoe talks about them through most of the book, you would think they're an oppressed people by humanity, and that they developed a largely insular society due to this oppression. Humanity hates vampires and want them dead, while vampires are slowly growing to hate humanity for this very reason. And considering that they have so many advantages over the regular human, it would make sense that vampires see themselves as superior, and that superiority complex would also make them less favorable in human life, right? <laughs> but what is a man? A miserable pile of secrets. Except no, that can't be right, because the story will go on to tell you that most of the famous artists and musicians in our current world are in fact vampires. And because this is an Oki town, we get people like Kenny Chesney, Garth Brooks, uh, Faith Hall, but then you also have people like William Shakespeare, Matthew McConaughey, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Hugh Jackman, all said to be vampires within this world. And because this was published in 2007, these are some very massive names in the movie industry. This was about the time X-Men was at its biggest popularity as movies. I think Matthew McConaughey... I don't know, that might have been near the tail end of when he was popular, but before he made a comeback. And, you know, obviously William Shakespeare... And it's not like being a vampire in this world is something that's super easy to hide, as it seems like the older you get as a vampire, the more of these super special tattoos you seem to receive. So obviously this brings the question, are vampires oppressed by humans, or are they the media darlings that the camera can't help but focus on? This actually reminds me a lot when I was trying to write a story. Now, this story was a basically kind of like a tiger and bunny ripoff world, but before I'd actually watched that anime. It was based on the idea that superheroes were real and there were famous media stars who would often take brand deals when fighting crime because that was the new entertainment and a lot of crime was staged for the sake of being on TV. And one of the things that I like to do with my friends is have them pitch me character ideas and concepts because it helps me think outside of my box and create different characters apart from the archetypes I tend to fall into. One of these times I had a friend create a character for this specific world. And they created a character who was manipulated by a cult who was fighting for the rights of super beings in this world, but were actually really supremacists. Except the problem with that was that violated the world I had already established. Now, how would a cult predicated on the idea that it's manipulating its members who desire equal rights as metahumans be able to operate like that? When in reality, in this world, having superpowers means you weren't just equal to humans, but you were actually kind of raised above them because you would, you would become a media darling. You basically, having, the, having super strength automatically made you a super popular movie star. Being a super was the fast track ticket to an easy life in this world. So how does a cult like this operate? 
And, and for the record, this is no hate towards my friend. We were all kids at the time. I mean, to, to be fair, I once wrote an entire story and didn't realize that I had named one of my side characters Fidel Castro until I had almost finished with the entire story. So, um, yeah. But in any case, that's not the only world building issue I have. Like, personally, I seriously want to know how this House of Night works. And not because I'm interested in it, but because I I'm trying to piece together how it makes logical sense. Okay, so, first things first, you're marked by a tracker vampire, you have to get to the Harris in that house of night, as your body immediately starts to deteriorate. It takes Zoe only about a day to get to the point where she can barely walk because of how long it took her, except, how does this work? I get the idea, narratively, is to present a way for someone like Zoe, with a lot of misconceptions about vampires, would have to go to the house of night despite all of her misgivings. But why exactly does being turned into a vampire start to slowly kill you unless you're in the House of Night? And why does being in the House of Night mitigate it? I think it's something of being near the adult vampires, but again, why? You would think maybe it's because of the change, which not every vampire survives even in the House of Night. So what exactly is the difference between them experiencing the change at home and experiencing it at the House of Night near some adult vampires? Maybe this was something that was explained, but I completely missed it. But honestly, the whole House of Night thing doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it too much. For example, this is a school, right? So how exactly do they handle the fact that their entire student body just slowly joins the school over the course of the school year? And we don't see any transition period, they just kind of show up and like, okay, have fun in class. And this would be forgivable if maybe the classes were the same as regular high school, but uh, they aren't. For example, this is Zoe's new schedule after arriving in the House of Night. First hour, Vampire Sociology. Second hour, Drama 101 Performing Arts Center. Or, Sketching 101. Or, Intro into Music. Third hour, Lit 101. See, okay, those two, make sense. But then you get to fourth hour, Fencing, Gymnasium. They get a lunch break. Fifth hour, Spanish 101. It was Zoe in Spanish? She doesn't say. Sixth hour, Intro into Equestrian Studies. Why is Equestrian Studies part of the curriculum? And where's the geometry here? Where's all the math classes? Where's all the science classes? Where's, there's, there's at least an English class, but like, like maybe I, I can excuse the science class being gone because of the fact that we're in a world where vampires are real, so maybe science isn't uh, seen as favorably as magic is, but... And, and remember, this is at least partway through the school year, since we literally start the book with Zoe complaining about a geometry test that she doesn't want to do, but then also complains later because she really wanted to do that geometry test and be a normal girl, so what the fuck ever, you know? Again, this circles back to what I was talking about with the House of Night and the marking of new vampires. How does it work? Like, what exactly alerts a tracker vampire to someone about to become a fledgling vampire? We see Zoe starting to get sick at the start of a book, so that implies the change starts before the tracker finds them. But it's only after the tracker finds them that they receive their mark. So how exactly is the tracker vampire important to the process? Do the people start the change and unless they're t touched by a tracker that they just die? Or it, it, so it's like the tracker bringing out the inner vampire? The, the, does, do they have the mark people in order to help them make the biggest hurdle of that change? Or is an entire a tracker vampire's entire job just to show up and point at the soon to be vampires like? <laughs> because I mean, it's not like they seem to hold any responsibility after they encourage the change. Once they mark someone, they basically just book it out the nearest exit and let the people deal with it on their own. We don't. There's a tracker vampire who marks Zoe. We don't ever see him again after he marks her. He doesn't stick around to explain the situation, doesn't try to take her into the house of night to ensure her safety, nothing. He just shows up and then claps his hands and says, I'm out, have fun. And there's obviously a lot of minor world building issues here and there. My favorite nitpick with this is the whole school uniform of the house of night. The house of night has a school uniform, but why? Stevie Ray in the book tells us that the school encourages students to individualize with their uniform. But if that's the case, why let them wear what they want? Why not just let them wear what they want within reason? Why have a uniform at all? The whole point of a uniform is to create that sense of, you know, uniformity. 
So by allowing kids to make major aesthetic changes, which include just wearing what shoes they want, wearing what pants they want, kind of thing, why not? It makes the uniform pointless because you no longer have that sense of uniformity. I will say, however, that the biggest issue I had with this book, surprisingly, is the parenthetical overload that happens. Now, as someone with ADHD, I'm very familiar with the usage of parentheses to continue thoughts because every new thought, even if it's connected to the previous, feels like I'm on a new subject. However, in this book, the cast do it way too often and most commonly for stuff they could have just left out of the book. Honestly, I think if you cut out every bit of parentheses in this book, this book would be half the length it is. Most of it is just Zoe being a judgmental bent, but sometimes there are things that when le that legitimately, I don't understand why the cast didn't just edit it into the main thought and remove the parentheses. For example, take this sentence on page 108. I've only had attention once so far, and that wasn't my fault. Really, some turd boy told me to suck his c what was I supposed to do? Cry? Giggle? Pout? Um, no. So I instead bitch slapped him. Parentheses. Although I prefer just using the word smacked. Parentheses. And I got detention for it. If you prefer to use the word smacked, why not just use the word smacked? If anything, if you just had to have a parentheses here, flip the two thoughts. Say something like, so I smacked him, though my friend Kayla would totally have preferred the term bitch slapped. It, it just flows much better and adds a sense of comedy, along with fleshing out the kind of relationship that she and Kayla would have had. Instead, as it is, it just furthers Zoe's holier-than-thou attitude by making her a, pu a pure sweet girl who doesn't like vulgar language. Or what about this sentence on page 134? Bunny had died of a sudden and very scary heart attack two years ago, and Grandma had been too upset to get another horse. She'd said that the rabbit, parentheses, which is what she used to call him, and parentheses, couldn't be replaced. This clarification is entirely unnecessary. The subject of this paragraph is a horse called Bunny, so when your grandmother refers to something as the rabbit, your average reader is going to be intelligent enough to put two and two together. When you stop the flow of the narrative to explain something this simple, not only are you breaking the reader's immersion, you're also taking them, you're also talking down to them, treating them like they're stupid. You know, obviously you're not smart enough to connect the fact that when the grandma says the rabbit, she's talking about a horse named Bunny, who was we were just talking about one sentence before. But let's move on to some final points with this book. Let's do some quick rapid critiques that may range from minor nitpicks to slightly more serious critiques, but don't really have a place in a long narrative. Uh, for example, like I was beginning to notice that Zoe had a real hang up with people's appearances. Anyone who is beautiful and pretty are considered good people. The only fledgling in this book who isn't described as a gorgeous Adonis or supermodel pretty is a kid named Elliot, the kid I talked about earlier, who is also a lazy dis who is also con called lazy, disrespectful, and annoying with teachers berating him for not being special enough like the rest of his classmates, and Zoe herself seems not to care that he died a rather horrible death. Or did he? Because apparently the two vampires who died during the change are seen later? Hmm. What if that setting something up? The funny thing is, despite the book clearly wanting me to see Elliot as an awful person, I can't. Because although he seems lazy and disrespectful, I have to admit, I don't think I'd be much better if I was in his situation. See, like, Im imagine, like, we don't know anything about Elliot or how he was taking to being a vampire. So just ask yourself, if you were randomly approached on the street by a random guy, forcibly given a forehead tattoo, and now not only do you have to be confined to a certain location known as the House of Night, with people who clearly don't like you because you're not as handsome as them, but you literally also can't leave or you'll die, not to mention that you only have about a 50-50% chance of living anyways even if you do stay, would you really be that enthusiastic about going to classes or learning to be a vampire as Elliot is? He, he's not there by his own choice. We don't know that he wants to be there and clearly he still loves his mom because his last dying thought is of his parents. So Zoe is also a terrible friend. Now I kind of brought this up when I complained about how judgmental she is, but this, this isn't just to a vampire friends who she openly admits that she only likes being friends with because they boost her ego, but also to her old human friends. 
when a friend Kayla and her boyfriend Heath, in a bit of a drunken stupor, come to the house of night in a good attention, if ill-advised, plan to rescue her, Zoe seems to just get annoyed with him that they even bothered to come by, and then gets frustrated with Kayla for being upset with her when she leaves. Like, uh, I'm sorry to break it with, to you, Zoe, but you were kind of the bad guy in this scenario. The, the moment you see them, you're like, oh my god, they're so annoying! You know? Uh, another complaint I have is that there's a lot of tonal dissonance between the words and the emotions of being conveyed in the scene. Like, on page 175, Zoe's supposed to be angry and mad, but then uses the word boobies in a sentence. Boobies is just one of those words you can't say while really angry, and not not and not make it sound somewhat comedic it's a lot like the word bubbles you ever want to cheer yourself up just try to say bubbles as angrily as you can and not crack a grin like bubbles <laughs> so another one uh the fact that this book takes place over the course of only a few days makes several scenes of this book hilarious when you consider how blindingly fast they must be occurring in universe I'll be honest with you, I think even the authors forget how little time is passing because of it. Now officially, I think only about four days pass between the start of this book and the end. But feasibly, I just don't think that can be possible So at all. So let, let's go ahead and pretend it was a full week. The first is that Zoe joins the school and then outs the incredibly popular Aphrodite from her position of power in only a week is hilarious. This also makes the friends she makes, the, the, the sycophantic friends she surrounds herself considering themselves true companions before the end just absolutely hilarious because, again, they've only known each other for about a week and Zoe goes from the start of one day saying, I know they're only my friends because my super special vampire powers, but I like them around because they do make me feel special. And then a few hours later on that same day going, oh my god, these people are like my soulmates in friend form. And, and, and this also means that Eric Knight, our vampire love interest, saw Zoe while he was being essayed, I will remind you, and then fell in love with her in like four days at most. Like he's literally declaring his love for her. This also makes a lot of smaller scenes in between funny. Like for one, Zoe, like Neferet gives Zoe some books from an advanced class, like two or three years ahead of where she is. And then the literal next day, like and, and she gives her these books and says, okay, just make sure to read one chapter a day. And then the literal next day, like not even 12 hours later, Neferet is pulling our character to the side and saying, how, how, how much of the book did you read? And, and Zoe's just like, it's, 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 it's been like less than a day since you gave me those. I haven't read any of it. And then she's like, oh, wow. Disappoint me. This also means that the Dark Daughters meet like every other day in the world because, again, I think the official timeline is four days. But even though I'm considering seven days, they do two meetings a week. Which, how do any of these kids get any sleep? Speaking of Neferet, I, I just, I love the way she attempts to relate to Zoe's complaints about her stepfather. Zoe is in Neferet's office complaining about her ultra-conservative stepfather and how much she hates him due to his controlling religious nature, and how he seems to have a negative effect on her mom. And Neferet seems to follow that up with, man, that really sucks. My dad <laughs> me when I was a kid. And I, I will give credit to the author here, Zoe uh, probably reacted the same way I would have, just getting growing silent and just kind of awkwardly staring at her because that, that's clearly taken off guard by this which would uh, you know it's a perfectly reasonable reaction it's like god my dad is so controlling you think that's bad my dad oh okay how about a little music uh, I, I, uh, if, the, if this goes along the line of me, my, my prediction being true of uh, Neferet actually being a bad guy in the future, I will give this scene credit in that it does come off with a subtle, my life was harder than yours, so shut up and stop complaining. Despite what Neferet is saying about that she's totally relating to what Zoe is saying and understands her struggles. Also, this book won't stop quoting Spider-Man. Like, I can't help but laugh each time the book about, about a super special vampire girl throws in the with great power comes great responsibility line at me like oh but i do think one of my favorite nitpicks about this book so far is the factually wrong statements it includes and i don't mean bad writing or how can this character be so stupid oh my god what did you get dropped on your head and then kicked into cement stupid there's plenty of those but i mean the author presents Zoe learning something as if it's fact, and it's it's not. 
for example, I'll give you that this book throws that the. I will give you that this book really does know it's Greek myth. It absolutely wallows in it, and it makes it ironic that I chose this book after my last nostalgic book being Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters. But, uh, hear me out. The bow of respect with our fists over our heart comes from the Amazons, and so does the way we shake hands, by gripping forearms. That's literally something that people in every culture where it's likely that someone who's right-handed would have a weapon up their sleeve does like it's a medieval thing it's an ancient european thing you're not special the amazons did not invent the handshake in fact the handshake predates amazonian myth by 50, 500 years one of the earliest known depictions of the handshake is actually an ancient assyrian relief in the 9th century bc depicting the assyrian king shalmaneser the third i'm gonna apologize I'm, I'm not good with these kind of names so just fair warning shaking the hand of the Babylonian king Marduk Zakir Shumi I to seal an alliance. Now the, myth, now, the myth of the Amazonians admittedly takes place sometime between 1900 BCE and 1200 BCE, but the actual myths were being written in 800 BCE by Homer, at least the earliest version that we can find of them. Furthermore, I just don't understand the reason to connect Amazonian myth to something as simple as a handshake. It just seems weird to me, like... I need to make the Amazonians cooler than they already are. Like, Wonder Woman doesn't already make the Amazons one of the fucking coolest things in the world. So let's give them the handshake. But there's also when they showcase a lack of understanding of Greek myth as well. Zoe meets Aphrodite, sort of minions, a trio of girls who name themselves after the Grey Sisters. Daimo, Daimo, Odino, Pamfredo, Again, sorry about these pronunciations. And Inyo. First of all, the story gets the translations wrong for the name, saying the names mean terrible, wasp, and warlike. In that order. However, the actual translation of those names, again, in that order, more accurately comes down to dread, alarm, and horror. But furthermore, the reason they, all, they, the reason they also claim that they believe the Grey Sisters, who are in myth described as being born as the hags they are, is a product of male propaganda. Which is, might be true, but the myth is more directly implying that the reason they're born this way is because a human childhood was so inconceivable to them due to their very nature of being able to see the fate of every being in the universe. Or, not, not, the, not the fate, those are the, those are the sisters of fate. But uh, the, basically, the way they can see the world, being a human child is just that inconceivable to them. So they were just born at how they are, always were. Also, while the book correctly labels them as the sisters of the Gorgons, specifically the Gorgon, because I, th I guess they've only heard of Medusa and don't realize that she has two sisters, the book also says they're the sister of Sicilla. 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 That one. Which I did find funny because the parentage of that one widely changes by the author. Most of the famous versions of the character have her mother as Cratesis, not Sito, and elect not to name a father. The first to name a father was actually Apollodorus, as far as I know, and he said that it was either Triton or Phoricus. Again, not good with pronunciation, meaning that there's only a 50% chance that Circula and the Grey Sisters actually share a father, which means there's only about like a 25% chance they're related at all. But there are a lot of other versions of this myth. Like the version where Hecate, 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 yeah, Hecate, is actually the mother of Sicula, or Hyginus, who, who argues that she's the daughter of Typhoon and the Echidna, or Echidna, not the Echidna. All in all, a lot of Greek myth here to unpack, and I can't tell if the author's making this mistake or the characters are. But considering how much Greek myth is stewed throughout without that same level of things, I'm gonna go ahead and guess the author. One final thing here, I didn't quite include this in my script, but I thought about it and I kind of want to talk about it. Zoe disowns her family really fast. And, and I don't just mean like she gets mad and storms out. She does. But she, uh, she disowns her family so fast, her and her mom get in a brief fight over her being turned into a vampire. And it's not just, I'm going to run away. I'm, I'm going to run away and do what I need to do on my own. 
it's Zoe leaves and literally wishes death on her family. Like, literally, yeah. And, and no, the fight is with her mother and her stepfather, not with her siblings, who she also wishes death on, by the way. No, of course you don't. The two of them act happy and pretend to like John and the whole damn make-believe family thing. So you smile at them and pray for them and let them do whatever. But me? And me? You think I'm the bad one because I don't pretend. Because I'm honest. You know what? I'm so sick of my life that I'm glad the tracker marked me. They call the that vampire school the house of night. But it can't be any darker than this perfect home. Before I could cry or scream, I whirled around. Whirled, whirled, whirled. Whirled around. <laughs> whirled around and stalked back to my bedroom, slamming the door behind me. I hope they all drown. There's a certain level of escalation you have to follow to make a character not seem awful, and this did not follow it. The, 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 the argument started over Zoe asking her mother to lie to her stepfather. Her mother got upset because that's a strictly held belief that she doesn't want to lie. Which, while in the scenario is a little harsh, is at least an understandable moral I can, under, I can see someone sticking behind. Just because this event is happening doesn't mean you want to start breaking, you know, these rules very close to you. It'd be like in another story, like, you know, with Sanji in um, One Piece. One of his biggest morals is he's never going to let someone starve. Because he himself has experienced that level of starvation that he cannot wish it upon anyone. Even people threatening to kill him. If they're hungry, I'll feed them. Very, very no noble quote. Very, very good quote, and it shows the nobility of Sanji that he sticks by his principles, even in hard situations. So, it's kind of one of those, we have to see the mother do something a lot more extreme, and we'd have to see the other family do something as extreme to justify Zoe's I hope they all die comment. In any case, 4 out of 10. <sighs> Yeah, this book is bad. It's really hard to get through at times, especially with just how much of a hypocritical, awful, holier-than-thou person Zoe acts like she is. But at the same time, it's still just kind of a young adult novel. I mean, there are some interesting ideas here and there, and it's clearly trying to ride on the coattail of the much more popular Twilight series. Again, I stand by my theory the Twilight fanfic that I have absolutely no reason to believe and I know is probably wrong. But otherwise, I mean... It's not among the worst thing I've ever read. It wasn't even that hard to read. Um, I've already started my next book review, The Founders. Not, not the next review, but the next reading of it. The Founders. And I can tell you, that's a book that's written in a way that's hard to read. But it, it's... I've read some truly terrible books. And this isn't even probably going to get near the top five. It probably was not even in the top ten. And if it is, it would be like number ten at best. But the question of whether or not it deserves Mount Doom... Is yes. I mean, I don't really think I can recommend this book to anyone. The character is thoroughly unlikable. The story is riddled with several small world building errors and mistakes, and the tonal dissonance is just awful. And, and to be honest, if you read more than two young adult books, you're probably going to easily predict where this book is going. Some minor predictions here myself that I'm going to put down in stone. Nefred is actually evil all along. Two, there's going to be some kind of evil counterpart to Nyx that she that Neferet is raising up. Maybe go with the Greek myth and go with Aether or Chaos, uh, her brothers in the myth. Somehow, Zoe's Cherokee ancestor that this book is constantly reminding us of is going to play a large part in the, either the backstory of this world or maybe the evil counterpart or just tie into how she's going to stop Neferet. If my thoughts on that, then you know the counterpart is wrong. Zoe 4. Zoe is going to continue to get more and more powerful as time gets on, getting more and more tattoos to the point that it's unreasonable. 5. She's going to date Eric Knight, but also decide to give Heath another chance so we can get our sought-after triangle of love. At least I hope it's Heath. I really hope the authors aren't going to go to that teacher route that they were kind of hinting at in this book. Uh, in any case, yeah, it isn't that great of a read, and personally, I don't recommend it. Honestly, I kind of left out talking about all the racism in this book, too, mostly because it was... It's kind of one of those, it's so minor that I'm not sure it actually is racism for, sh for like, complete sure. But, you know, it... Honestly, if I had to recommend you a vampire series, I would just tell you to check out Anne Rice's interview with a vampire. Or, if that's a bit too heavy for you, go ahead and check out Cirque de Freak by Darren Chant.
With that being said, just remember, with every book comes an adventure. And every adventure is worth having, even the bad ones. Mm -hmm.